the Lax Factor Podcast. What is up, college across fans? You're watching episode, I think we're at 183 of uh, the Lax Factor Podcast. Today we are going to do, as promised, the Big Ten, my Big Ten uh, conference predictions in terms of who's going to be the worst team in the conference and who's going to be the best team in the conference. Uh, no camera today, so you don't get to gaze upon my beautiful face because my cat broke my camera. I do have another one, the exact same camera. I just didn't have it hooked up yet this morning. So no camera today, but you do have the screen share to, to, to kind of go along with. So before I get into everything, as always, be sure to like, subscribe, all that crap if you're watching on YouTube. Share if you're listening audio only or if you're watching on Spotify. Let people know we have the video version out on Spotify as well now. And, uh, and as always, you can go to laxfactor.com. You can hit the shop up. We have t-shirts, all that crap. You can get some Lax Factor branded stuff for the podcast, or you can get some random lacrosse t-shirts as well. So that is it. Let's get into it. And we are going to start with my number, my, the team that I think is going to finish last in the Big Ten. And I think this is going to be a battle for last place in the Big Ten. Uh, but I think Michigan, 2-8 uh, and eight last year, I think they probably will finish last in the Big Ten. And the reason being is that, you know, the story of this team, they have a talented offense. They have one of the most talented players in the country on attack in Josh uh, Zawada. And, uh, but you know, that's, a, that's about it. Defensively in cage, they are not strong. They have not been strong and that is going to hurt them in the end. So that's their big question mark, defense and goalkeeping and defense and goalkeeping is a big question mark in the big 10 in general, unless you are Maryland and Rutgers. So let's get a little bit deeper. What they have coming back, as I said, Josh Zawada, very talented lacrosse player, 24 goals, 15 assists in 2021. Uh, let's see here. Do we have a picture of Zawada here? Josh Zawada, 6'1", 175. Skinny kid. I had said two years ago that he just needed to put some weight on. Hasn't done that yet, but he is a very capable scorer. Legitimately just about capable of taking over a game. Zawada is the real deal. So Maryland, that's or, or for Michigan, it's a big deal having him back. Michael Bohm, 21 goals, 15 assists. Bryce Clay is back, 23 and 4. Avery Myers, 13 and 12. So no, no question, Michigan was able to put points on the board. A lot of teams in the Big Ten last season, like Penn State, did not put a whole lot of points on the board. Michigan was able to do that. The problem ended up being they gave up too many points in the process and route to a two and eight regular season record. So uh, let's see here, Nick. Rowlett, Fogo, 53-plus percent. That's not bad. They get possessions. They'll score goals. The problem ends up being can they stop people on defense. Pieces at defense. Gavin Legg is back. He had seven cause turnovers. But everything else, big question mark for Michigan down at defense and in the cage. So I like, like I said, I mean, I could I could do a boatload more research on this, but I don't know. And am I, am I going to research a team that was two and eight last year in their in their conference? Probably not going to talk about them all that much because their fan base is small at this stage, and they stunk last year. So I, I don't think they were they stunk so bad that they were a two and eight team. That's the problem with what the Big Ten did last year. A lot of these teams, uh, Hopkins and Michigan, both of them finished two and eight last year. And I, they wouldn't have finished two and eight if they if they played their normal Big Ten schedule. They probably would have been in the area, you know, of you know probably four or five wins because they would have definitely picked up some non-conference wins. So they weren't that bad of a team. It's just in terms of conference this year, they're back to playing the normal uh, five game. I think it's a, what a five game uh, Big Ten schedule. And let's see, yeah. So they'll be back to playing a five-game Big Ten schedule, and that will make a hell of a lot more sense uh, for them because they may lose all five Big Ten games, although I don't think they will. I think they'll pick up a win or two in the Big Ten this year. Even with them and uh, me picking them to be in the basement, I'm an idiot, so they absolutely could end up winning two, uh, probably two games I would give them. I think that's their ceiling, and I think their floor is 0-5. Uh, in the conference, but I, I I wouldn't be surprised to see him pick up one game. I think that's probably met the over under uh, would be fair, and then they could end up picking up two because they could beat like a Penn State or a Hopkins or someone like that. But I don't think they're going to beat either of the top two teams. I, I do expect also for Josh Zuwada to have a big season. It looks like he changed his number as well. We'll have to see, but I am a big Josh Zawada fan. Therefore, I will watch every Michigan game that I get a chance to watch because he is worth tuning in for, uh, for damn sure. Uh, my second to last team here, uh, the team I've picked to uh, go fourth in the Big Ten is Penn State. They finished four and six last year, middle of the pack, but gone 
are Mac O'Keefe and Dylan Folds on offense, and an already suspect defense uh, will be led by a new goalie. They lose their goalie, Kobe Kniece, to graduation. He had a rough year last year anyway because of that defense that was suspect in front of him. The reason I think these guys could actually end up getting uh, supplanted and, and they could actually drop all the way down to last is because offensively they have almost – no one coming back. They were not great on offense last year, even with Dylan Folds and O'Keefe in the mix. O'Keefe being, you know, the guy you thought was going to be their leading scorer. But TJ Malone ended up being their leading scorer last year. 25 goals, 18 helpers. O'Keefe Folds gone. They have a batch of st- scorers that are returning that had between 12 to 8 points. So uh, Reynolds, Trainer, and Myers are among those guys. But a lot of question marks on the offensive side of the ball. I know they ended up picking up a transfer. I know they have a, a couple of incoming freshmen that are solid. But you got to prove that you're, you're willing to hang. And last year, offensively, they were terrible. Terrible offensively, even with a guy like Mac O'Keefe, who ended up going on to play pro and had a great PLL season and is now playing box and doing well. Uh, they also have to replace Kobe Kniece in cage. Like I said, that's not good because their defense was already not very good. Kobe Kniece, who was a more than capable goalie, a guy that I picked to be my goaltender of the year back in 2019, he, he has not played up to, I think, the standards he probably set for himself and that people like me ended up having for him. So the, if, if a quality keeper like Canise struggled with the defense that he had in front of them, you know, why, why is, oh, I didn't even change my screen here for you guys. So you guys are probably getting pretty bored. Uh, so yeah, if a guy like Canise struggled in cage, why is a rookie going to do any better with the defense that they have in front of them? Still pretty rough. So I think Penn State, I haven't picked as fifth In the big, I would not be surprised to see Michigan and them swap spots. I think, once again, the over-under for Penn State in terms of wins and losses is probably one. Even though they were 4-6 and last year, you you lose two of your top three scorers, so I don't think that's going to bode well for them. You lose your goalkeeper. They lost some other pieces as well. So I do not like Penn State's chances. I think that maybe two wins. Two wins might be their over-under. Maybe I'm being a little bit harsh on them. But, I mean, the the days of them having the the best players in the field – whenever they took the field, especially that best duo of O'Keefe and um, uh, what's-his-nuts there. Uh, that's that's long gone, and now they've got to figure it out, and, and new guys are going to have to step up. Now, don't get me wrong. TJ Malone is legit, and I actually had high hopes for guys like Reynolds, Trainer, and Myers last year, and they just didn't put up the points that we thought they were going to. So I could be totally wrong on this one too, but I think it's fair to say the over-under on these guys is probably two wins, and that fifth is probably a pretty fair spot for me to pick for them. Now, the next team that we're going to run with here is uh, Johns Hopkins. Johns Hopkins' defense was not a strong suit of any of the teams that finished in the bottom four of the big last season, which is why Maryland and Rutgers both did so well. Hopkins, one of those teams with a plethora of offensive weapons, but a defense that has more holes than Swiss cheese. They're just not looking very good on defense overall. Back, though, on offense, Connor DeSimone, uh, switching DeSimone from midfield to attack was a huge success last year. He went 25-20. and 20. Joey Epstein's back. He went 23-2. and two. Uh, Garrett Degnan, 12 goals, 12 assists. So he's back. Keo, 9 goals. Brendan Grimes, 8 goals. So offensively, they have a lot of talent, and they've brought in some other guys. They brought in a transfer, I believe. They brought in, a, you obviously have some young talent that's coming in as well. Uh, in cage, Josh Kersan, he was a transfer from Ohio state. He went 39% between the pipes last year. That is terrible, but I'd still put that less of that on him and more on the defense. When he was at Ohio state, he was in the area of 45, 50%, I believe for his first two or three seasons at Ohio state. So a big question mark still, but he, he's still a talented goalkeeper that's capable. So long as you can put any semblance of a defense in front of him, he'll get you 45 to 51, 52% save percentage on the season. So not going to be good enough, I don't think, to jump Hopkins to be on third in the big. And, you know, coming from a two and eight season, I'm not sure. I think the over under on Hopkins technically would be two or three wins. I'm going to say I think their over under is three wins. I think they're going to be much improved, especially offensively. I think now that you got the a new head coach with a, you know, a, some, some, experience at Hopkins under his legs now. Everybody's going to be back. Everybody's a little bit better. I also think that Joey Epstein could be the dark horse. Joey Epstein could be the guy that if he plays 
like he played his freshman year. He just has not looked himself. Last season, even though he was supposedly healthy and back, he did not look himself. 23 goals, two helpers. is uh, that, That's not Joey Epstein-level numbers. So if they can get Epstein back above even just 40 points, that greatly increases Hopkins' chance of, of maybe jumping up to third in the big. But right now I have them finishing fourth in the big um, behind the next team that we're going to talk to or talk about which is Ohio State. Now, they were 4-6 and six last year in the big, and they did lose Trey LeClaire and some other guys. But once again, defense, not their strong suit, but they were not the worst defensive team in the Big Ten. And for them, they return a ton of offensive talent and add in a new goaltender in Caton Johnson, UNC transfer, who I presume he ends up getting the spot in cage. But I like Ohio State's chances to finish third in the Big Ten, and they could even make a little bit more noise. I think the over-under for wins for these guys in the Big Ten this upcoming season is three. I think that they'll they'll probably get three wins, and then you know that last win there is going to determine if they end up finishing second in the Big Ten or third in the Big Ten. And guys that are back and why I think they have a really good shot at finishing second in the Big Ten uh, as so long as things line up for him and injuries don't hurt them. Jack Myers, 34 goals and 11 helpers. He was their leading scorer last year. They lose their second leading scorer in Trey LeClaire, but back are Jackson Reed, very capable lacrosse player, 15 goals and 11 helpers. Griffin Hughes had a good season last year, 16-3. and three. Justin Inacio back. 55% winner of draws, 63 ground balls. He's going to be good. And, and keep in mind, too, you, you see the stats for a lot of these guys, and it doesn't sound like they've got a lot of guys putting up a lot of points for any of these teams. It's because they played a 10-game regular season. So if they didn't make the play, if you didn't make the playoffs, you got 10 games and that was it, which puts you about two or three games under the average. So when you're hearing some of these guys' points totals, point totals, and you're like, oh, man, that guy only had 45 points, that's not a whole lot in the general scheme of things, partly because they didn't play as many games as everybody else. And we got famous, YouTube famous Mitchell Pelkey, three goals, four assists last year. I expect him to get above 10 here this season. He's been training his butt off, at least with a lot of really important people. Maybe that kind of helps him a little bit as well. So overall, I like Ohio State's chances at having a good season. I, like I said, I think that over-under is three wins. And I think that if they get that, obviously they pick up that that fourth win uh, and they beat the over-under that I'm putting on them, then they're in fourth uh, or second place in the Big Ten. But I do have them finishing third in my preseason rankings here. Now, I am going to go out on a limb here. And I'm going to be honest. Originally, I had Rutgers way further down this list. I had Rutgers dropping all the way down this list from second place last season at 8-2. and two. There are only two losses coming to Maryland in the regular season. Did not make the did they make did they make the tournament? I can't remember. They had to have made the tournament at eight and two. Um, but either way, I I had them dropping all the way from second in the Big Ten down to last in the Big Ten, and the reason or not not last but uh, fifth. And the reason was they lost everybody. They lost one hundred and sixty five points between their three starting attackmen last year: Charlem Beatties, Kirst, and Mullins. That's a lot of production to lose over one season. They'll need to rely on their strong defense, which they had a very strong defense, and they have key pieces returning on that side of the field. And then they also have solid talent returning on the offensive side of the field. As I kind of got through this a little bit more, I was like, well, you know what? I remember that guy, and I liked that guy, and so on and so forth. So as we as we kind of dive into what they have back from their 8-2 and two, uh, season last year in the big, Ethan Rawl, LSM, 14 caused turnovers. And this is the only team I'm really going to dive into the defense because truly it's the strength of their team. Uh, coming back here. Ethan Rawl, uh, 14 cause turnovers. He's a solid LSM. Jared Jean-Felix, 12 cause turnovers. The dude kind of broke out last year. And I don't know if he broke out where everybody was talking about him, but I watched almost every Big Ten game last year, and I watched every Rutgers game last year. And uh, solid. Solid as hell defender. Big, long, fast. Uh, can beat people up. Uh, and then in cage, Colin Kirst, kid had 56.6% save percentage last year, third team All-American. So that doesn't hurt, you know, getting a, a solid goalkeeper that had a great season like Kirst did last year back. So that's reason to be optimi optimistic for Rutgers, even though they lost the farm in terms of offensive talent from their attack. But then they get in transfer Mitch Bartolo. I don't think Bartolo is going to come in necessarily and be their leading scorer, but he's certainly capable of doing so. Transfer from Penn hasn't played meaningful lacrosse in a long time, but 17 goals in 2019 veteran. Now he's playing in the big. So the, the kid knows big time lacrosse coming from the uh, Ivy. 
and now he's going to be playing in the big, and I think that he's going to be key for these guys. And then guys like David Sprock, 17 goals, 10 helpers. Shane Knobloch, 16 goals, 5 assists. I mean, these are midfielders that put up good points, solid point totals here for for Rutgers last season, and they're just going to be expected to do more. And then watch out for a guy like Tommy Coyne and Ryan Gallagher as well. Both could be 20-plus point guys. They they actually put up point more points earlier in their careers. And then last year, they didn't have quite as many, uh, probably just because of kind of how the offense shifted down to the the ridiculous attack they had. Cursed ate some of the points that they may have picked up otherwise. Uh, Sprock and Knobloch definitely did as well. But th- even though they lost all that talent on offense uh, between Charlene Beatty's Cursed and Mullins, they return a lot of talent. And like Coyne and Gallagher, I think that they could easily be guys to jump from. I think their point totals were in the teens last year. They could easily jump to 20, 30 plus each. So they're going to spread it out. I don't think that Rutgers is going to have anyone that's going to dominate a game completely, but they have enough talent all o- over the field, I think, to finish second in the Big Ten again because I think that defense is really going to anchor them. And then also keep in mind, uh, important to note that uh, uh, my over-under here is still three. I I, I really think that Rutgers and Ohio State could kind of be interchangeable here. So once again, I'm I'm saying I think they'll get three wins, and if they get that fourth win, then they're, you know, and and let's say a couple of teams could go three and two and they need a tiebreaker, but I think that Rutgers is right there. I think picking them second or third, in my case, I'm I'm calling second is my hot take. I think that's fair, and I think Rutgers has done a great job in the transfer portal, picking up key pieces where they've lost guys, and then just retaining some talent and developing guys like Sprock and Knobloch into legit players. That's that's helped them as well. And then you get a pair of Cuse transfers. I don't know if Justin... um, if uh, oh, what the hell are their names? The Kim brothers there. I don't know if they're going to play or how they'll contribute, but they could certainly add depth to the midfield and and get some time for Rutgers as well. They're, they they D- Rutgers is a team that has depth, and that's why I like their chances this year. Now we get on to the team that it, it's not even going to be close here. Uh, Maryland's going to to win this conference. I I do not see anyone upsetting Maryland. I see them going a perfect five and zero in conference play. That will mean that they'll end up being fifteen and zero in conference play in the last two seasons. I fully expect them to sweep it, uh, even though they lose Bernhardt, you know the Twarton winner, and they lose guys like Nick Grill on defense. They have way too much talent returning on both offense and defense. It's absolutely gross. Logan Wisnowskis back, 41-31, and 31. Uh, 39% shooting percentage. I expect now that he's going to be the man. That'll probably drop a little bit, but he's still going to put up 75-plus points, I presume, in 2022. Daniel Maltz is back. He was 40-10 and 10 last year. Kyle Long, 16-28. and 28. Anthony DeMeo, who I thought transferred um, for some reason, 24-19. and 19. He's back on their roster. Bubba Fairman, 19-7. and seven. Bubba. And then they get transfer Keegan Kahn uh, from Nova. Honorable mention All-American. I actually missed this uh, Keegan Kahn, I believe, in talking about big transfers. Uh, I don't know how I missed that because he's a huge transfer from Nova. Honorable mention All-American. Uh, 179 career points at, at, at Nova. So that's a huge graduate transfer for Maryland. And technically, Maryland's graduate transfers alone could win them the big with what they have coming back. Then they also get uh, Jonathan Donville transferred in from Cornell. He'll contribute heavily, I think. Matt Rahill on defense. Man, these guys barely are going to skip a beat. Matt Rahill, uh, Matt Rahill, Brett Maycar, John Gepper, all back to help anchor this defense. Roman Paglazi back to anchor the defensive midfield to scoop up GBs on draws. Logan McEnany back in cage. He was 52% last season. Probably should have been higher than that. Uh, I'll say part of the reason he probably wasn't is because the you know the the big did have talented offensive teams, but I'd like to see his uh, save percentage improve. Section four guy though, got to give him a shout out. Corning kid, I'm a section four guy. He's also a section four guy. We actually lost to Corning in the sectional finals my senior year, uh, twenty one to seven. We got absolutely smoked, but hey man, we made it to the sectional finals. That was dope. Uh, Logan Mac. Oh yeah, I just said Logan McEnany. So I mean, I could I could wax wax on and on about Maryland here. I'm not going to because I got to go to a birthday party for my kids. So uh, uh, today's going to be a short episode. But moral of the story: Maryland's winning this thing, and it's not even going to be close. Now for next week's show. I'll just show you this here. We got inside lacrosse. This is the one I'm going to do. I'm going to rip through for next week's show, and we're going to talk about every team in Division I. I'm going to use this as my outline, and I'll add some anecdotes for every single one, but the show next week is going to be awesome. So if you're watching or listening to this now, 
make sure to tune in next weekend on Sunday morning because we're going to go through every single team in D1 using this X. This has been one of my favorite things that they've done over the last couple of years where they're talking, they talk about every team and it's actually a place where I put together some notes here and there early on. So I know what to talk about. So next week's show, we're going to go through every team, talk about every single team, at least a little bit may end up breaking it up into two shows if it ends up being long, but I'm going to record it as one. So that'll be big, but Hey, quick show today. So that's it. Thanks everyone for tuning in. Be sure to uh, like, subscribe, all that crap. Go to laxfactor.com. Support us beyond that. Be sure to tune in next weekend on Sunday morning. We'll go through every single team in the country and talk about all of them for at least a minute is what the goal is going to be. So this is going to be a really long podcast. Uh, I know some of you will like that and uh, that's it. Hoost is, oh, and I'll have my camera back also. So you'll be able to gaze upon my beautiful face. Uh, So that's it. Hoost is out, and I'll be back next weekend, folks.